Welcome to Creative Talks. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. Almost 10 years ago, guitarist Josh Schwartz and drummer Chris Heron formed the Washington, D.C. area-based metal band A Sound of Thunder. Nina Osgeda soon followed as the band's powerful vocalist. After a few changes in the bass player position, Jesse Keane completed the current lineup, bringing his talent on the keyboards as well. The recording and production of the albums were funded through successful Kickstarter campaigns, each one more financially successful than the last. Today, founding members Josh and Chris join me to talk about their latest album and comic, It Was Metal. In 2018, A Sound of Thunder released It Was Metal, a comic anthology with stories based on the tracks on the album of the same name. The book contains the song lyrics and 10 stories to accompany each track. In addition to Josh Schwartz and Nina Osgeda, receiving story credits, other contributors include Shadowman artist Bob Hall, Roberto De La Torre, Rafer Roberts, Ben Templesmith, Barry Kitson, and Mustafa Musa. How do Josh and Chris define heavy metal music? What subgenre of hard rock and heavy metal influence their sound? And what's in the works for their 10th anniversary as a band? And will we see another comic from them? Plus, they take a crack at the fun questions I ask all my guests. Today's episode is sponsored by The Comic Book Shop in Wilmington, Delaware. All are welcome, just be nice. Now let's join Josh Schwartz and Chris Heron of A Sound of Thunder, here now on Creator Talks. Josh, welcome to Creator Talks. Hey, thanks for having us. And Chris, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Josh, you and drummer Chris Heron established The Sound of Thunder back in 2009, almost 10 years now. Where did you two first meet? I was in a band before this, and Josh joined that band. And that, long story short, that band broke up because one of the uh, musicians was deployed. So the last, literally the last show, you know, we put all the stuff away and Josh and I grabbed a beer and we were talking. We said, well, what do we want to do? Why don't we start our own band? Well, you went through several lineup changes in the first year and then your amazing, powerful vocalist, Nina Asigueda, joined you. And then things began to solidify. And now you stand with uh, Jesse Ken on bass and keyboards and things just clicked with everyone. I'm just wondering, why do you think that with a lot of bands, they go through a lot of bass players. I don't know why that is, but I've just seen that happen. It's always just that position. It was really hard for us to find a bass player. That was the last position we built. We only had two singers. We had Nathan Matzinger was our first singer, and he never recorded with us. And then Nina, it's Nina Osageda. Found Nina on Craigslist. Actually, all four of us met on Craigslist. So go Craigslist. We'll do an ad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the bass position, man, Jesse is our fifth official bass player, I think. And then we had several, we had a ton of auditions and uh, some temporary fill-ins. We, there's just uh, a session bassist plays on our first EP. It takes a special personality to really devote yourself to the bass because it's not really, I don't think it's perceived as a like a spotlight instrument. You know, it doesn't have right. the glory attached to it of the lead singer or the guitar position. It doesn't have the uh, that all-consuming, like, focus that the drums require. And drummers are their own special breed, obviously. <laughs> guilty. guilty. Bass, bass somehow seems like the least sexy or the least prestigious, to, I think, although it shouldn't be. Well, one, one of the things I would add about, as far as Jesse's concerned, he not only plays bass, he also has a facility on the keyboards as well. And that has creeped into our music, will at some points I'm sure continue to do so. You play mainly in the Washington, D.C. area, but you recently returned from touring Catalonia, Spain at the end of October. Please share why you chose that particular location and the connection it has with your singer, Nina. Well, um, we were uh, very fortunate to have a pretty big hit over there. Um, we covered the national anthem of Catalonia. The song is called El Segador's. We had covered it for our album, It Was Metal, and uh, really for no other reason than Nina's mother is from Catalonia originally. She wanted to do something for her mom, but something that fit within the context of the band. And this particular anthem is very metal. The traditional musical arrangement is very somber, sounds a little Soviet almost, 
The lyrics are just brutal. It's about farmers raising up their sickles and fighting up for independence against an oppressor. It's just super metal. So it really lent itself to a metal cover. So we recorded it. We had it completed and waiting for the album release, which was going to be in 2018. And on October 1st, 2017, the Catalonians had a referendum for independence from Spain. And the Spanish national government sent in the national police to stop the vote. They confiscated ballot boxes, but uh, more importantly, they actually were beating people in the streets, like women and old ladies, and elderly people were getting beaten up. And so we saw this and Nina was the one that said, hey, we should put this song out early, show our support and show that we see what's going on there. And uh, so we did that. We put it out a couple days later on October 3rd or 4th, and it went viral instantly got a million and a half views in the first week which doesn't even really sound like that much but it was all within the catalonia region wow so super super duper concentrated so it would be like population wise it would have been if we had gotten like 30 million views in a week in the u.s hmm. so it was everywhere um got coverage on catalonian national tv and radio Reuters came to our house here in manassas virginia and interviewed us about it we were in a bunch of news outlets so it was a pretty big deal. And for us, it was far and away the biggest thing that ever happened to us. And so we found ourselves with a lot of new fans in Catalonia and a uh, big demand to go there. And uh, from there, it was a no-brainer. People started messaging us, asking us to play. We figured out that we were going to be able to cover the cost of our airfare and go do it. So we did it. Now, this wasn't your first trip, though, right? That was our first trip to Europe. Oh, wow. Last really? Year. Last year. Oh, last yeah. year. Okay. That was December. December. Yeah. We had played Canada before. We had flown to and played some gigs on the West Coast of America. But this was our first time going overseas. How was the reception from the crowd? They've heard your music before. So I guess they were extremely enthusiastic and thrilled to see you in person. Well, we were expecting everybody to go nuts for El Segador's. But being um, a relatively small band, we've been building, slowly building an audience fans around the world for almost 10 years, but on a humble scale. And we were kind of expecting everybody would know El Segador's, but they wouldn't know the other songs. And they might even heckle us to try and get us to play El Segador sooner so they could leave. <laughs> and uh, none of that happened. We got there and man, the crowds were, they were into it. They were paying attention. Nobody yelled for El Segador's. We always played it last, the very end of a 90 minute set. And the most surprising thing of all is we saw people in the audience singing along to our other songs like Uteroth and Time's Arrow and Kill That Bitch. Yeah, so they were uh, they were fully into it. A bit of a surprise, but really gratifying. Now, you also encountered some challenges during your tour, some technical issues. This year we did. We've had two tours of Catalonia. Last year, the weather wasn't really cooperating. The very first show we did was like a trial by fire. We got off the plane, went to the Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, played in front of 50,000 people. We we played one song. We played, actually, we played a second verse. Yeah, we opened the event. With we opened the event, and I think everyone in the band would agree it's one of the most thrilling moments. Certainly was in my life, anyway. That was kind of the introduction, if you yeah. will. It was nerve-wracking. It was cold that day. It was probably in the 40s. Yeah, it was cold. And uh, so uh, you probably know that's really bad for a singer's voice. So especially Nina sings a lot of power. And she's got to get up into the high range and she's got to do some screams. So she pretty much uh, blew out her voice after that first performance and was uh, was struggling for the rest of the tour. That was the big challenge on the first tour. I guess you're getting used to dealing with these things because you've toured a lot. You've played a lot over the past 10 years and even before that. So you're probably really adept at handling these things fairly quickly to make sure the show can go on. Yeah, I mean, we just had a discussion about this the other day where Chris was saying that he didn't have uh, good monitors during most of the shows. You know? And that, yeah, that happens that happens pretty frequently, actually, whether it be there or here. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of a reality. And basically, in between songs, you have to alert someone that you're having a problem. you, you got to be proactive and be kind of aggressive sometimes against states. Stop. I can't hear you. And make sure that 
you, you do everything you can do as a musician to right that situation. But at the same time, we've got a lot of experience playing in places in America where we just we don't even expect to have monitors sometimes. So I know for me, like as long as I can hear the snare drum, I can get through a show. I don't need to hear anything else. You know, we're pretty well trained and barrel through with technical problems. Well, let's talk a bit about metal music. Now, one's choice of music is personal. It is what moves and inspires them. Some people dismiss metal as all sounding the same. I know someone like that. Um, but I'm married to her, so what can I do about it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I understand that mentality because when I was little, I grew up listening to a lot of country music, not by choice. It was a second hand. It was dad's music. And I was working with him and I would hear this stuff on a track repeatedly. And it all sounded the same to me. All sounded the same. But, you know, over time, when you're exposed to that much and you listen to it, there's a big difference between Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and Johnny Paycheck and, you know, all those. So whether or not you like it, you certainly learn to appreciate it and can tell something that's really good from something that's not so good or copying somebody else. I always give something a few listens before I pass judgment. Some albums took a few listens, but then I was hooked. It's like, where has this been all my life? And I will say that when I heard your album, I loved it immediately. How would you define your brand of music, your brand of metal music? Man, well, I feel like we're right on the line where if you're um, over a certain age, we're kind of classic metal. And if you're younger, we might even just call us hard rock. We all have different influences in the band. But a lot of my favorite bands are bands that I always thought of as metal bands. And I know that a lot of other people consider rock bands now. So Black Sabbath is probably my single biggest influence. I think most people still consider them metal, but I know some people consider them hard rock now. Deep Purple is another one, and I think a lot more people probably consider that hard rock. To me, I think we're a classic traditional metal band in the vein of uh, Iron Maiden and Priest and Sabbath and that kind of thing. A little bit of progressive touches here and there, a little bit of classic rock touches here and there, a little bit of more modern power metal. Mainly, I consider us traditional metal. That's just me. I don't know. Chris might have a different... No, I would, I would agree with that, uh, Josh, but of his influences and mine are more of a rush nut and a tool nut. And so, but that being said, you know, when we compose a song, all four of us have input and, and it's, and we all basically, you know, listen to it, analyze it. Okay. Try it out. If it, Hey, let's see if it fits. Okay. Well, maybe we can change a little something and make it fit. And I think that's one of the remarkable things that this band, I think it's certainly one of the things that I enjoy about it. I can definitely tell that there's a collaboration amongst everyone because it doesn't sound like one or two people are controlling the whole band and there's the same sound throughout. There were many different kinds of metal. There's thrash, there's doom, there's new. What is an essential ingredient of music to fall within the metal category? Oh, gosh. I would say, well, I guess I would step back and say, um, as we all, we meaning you, yourself, and Josh and I, there are so many different subsets of metal. You mentioned a few of them earlier. And there's a certain degree of, I'll use the word power, if I might use that word. You're going to reach the audience. You're going to get, quote, quote, in their faces. And they, hopefully, they'll respond. You know, and, and, and you can also achieve that in certain different ways it doesn't have to always be blast beats and whatnot you can do that in certain ways in different ways i think that's key i think that you have to you can't just you can but you, 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 you can, i think you're more successful if you change things up a little bit and uh, and still have the power pack the punch and present it in such a way there's some things that are just you know objectively are common to metal you know overdriven guitar a little more gain on the guitar than you'd find in a, just a regular rock band double kick drums although not all metal has double kick vocally you could have the screams or if you get in death metal or modern metal you get the growls but i don't know i think underline it all you know chris said power to me it's a, a little bit of aggression or forcefulness that goes beyond what you get from pop or rock there's a particular emotion to metal that appeals to uh you need to let loose a little bit i think you know it gets you pumped up gets your energy up it's hard to put a finger on it but something something about the way it makes you feel the part of your brain it appeals to I tell you it's great for working out too like does it make you angry no but i get pumped up and i want to work out so i listen to that while i'm working out i don't really like a lot of music that would make me angry but i like no. that gets me excited or <laughs> right for working out yeah exactly your band has a very strong fan base and you've had support through your albums making them or starting them through Kickstarter campaigns. Tell me why you chose to go that route. Now, I mean, I would think, you know, having 
studio time, recording, mixing, that can be quite expensive. It is expensive. And especially you know, for us, we've never cut any corners. The first EP and album we did were a little less expensive, but they were still done in professional studios. We, we never tried to like home record or anything like that. And everything since our second album has been with the same producer, Kevin Gutierrez, in his studio, Assembly Line Studios. He's got platinum records. Like He's not cheap. He's worth every cent, but it's definitely um, good budget is required to cut our records. So we didn't have a big fan base established after our second album, which we funded ourselves. Uh, we, it wasn't enough to get attention of any record label, but we knew we wanted to keep going. We, we, we knew we wanted to do things right and not cut corners, not half-ass anything. We had big songs like Time's Arrow, that was, you know, 10 minutes, it's epic, and it's got to have the power, and it's got to be recorded right. You know, we knew we needed to do that, and we knew a record label wasn't going to pay for it, so the obvious answer for us was to try and get our fans to fund it. Times Arrow was our first attempt at crowdfunding. We're very lucky that it, and grateful that it was successful. But that kind of started us down that road of crowdfunding. I ship all the Kickstarter rewards and handle fulfilling everything for the Kickstarters, so we've just kind of always gone by the philosophy of our fans are our record label we couldn't do this stuff without them, so we always treat them like gold, you know, treat them as well as we can. And I think people are taking notice. You know, I think they did that Times Arrow Kickstarter. They got an album that was better than they expected. It sounded better than they expected. The songs were maybe better than they expected. The artwork was better. We did a deluxe box set on that album, which was like ridiculous for a band with as small a fan base as us at that time. But we did like, you know, like a $60 deluxe box set. Chris wrote a short story for it. It was in a big, beautiful box. It came with a shot glass. And a bunch of other stuff. And I think people just said, wow, like this band takes care of its fans. We gave value for the money. Also, we stayed in close touch directly with the fans. You know, people can always get a hold of us. And from there on, the Kickstarters just grew and grew. You know, we started on that first one, we raised $8,000. The next one was 23,000. Then it was 30,000. Then it was 36. The last one was for It Was Metal. We raised, uh, geez, $70,000 between two campaigns for that album. It's just building trust with the fans now. So now they know if they back one of our campaigns, we're going to do our absolute best and go all out to give them the best thing we can. Well, It Was Metal was not your first time blending comic book storytelling with music. In the past few years, you've also partnered with Valiant. Uh, you did the uh, Dr. Mirage Second Lives, Tales from the Dead Side. What attracted you to the idea of combining comics and metal music? That was mostly Nina and I. We're the comics nerds in the band, I guess. Jesse is more of a video game nerd. Chris, an old school Star Trek. Old school Star Trek. <laughs> old school Star Trek. No, that's not true, actually. What Josh is saying is correct. I'm not, I'm, I've actually learned a lot about the comic world since we have been doing this. I mean, I read a lot, but I read a whole lot, but I don't read a lot of comics. I don't read any. I don't read comics. We're, so we're all different types of geeks, but Nina and I were mostly the comic book fans. And in particular, I grew up on Shadow Man. Valiant existed in an, an earlier incarnation of the company in the 90s, and they were a pretty big publisher, and they had this comic Shadow Man, who was uh, kind of a dark uh, voodoo slash occult-themed hero. His alter ego, Jack, his job was he was a jazz musician. He was a saxophonist. And he used to hang out in jazz clubs and play with band. You know, I always thought that was cool, like part of what attracted me to becoming a musician. But anyway, that, that character was close to me. In 2012, Valiant rebooted the character. They started the lineup again. I was in buying the comics right away. And uh, one day, uh, Nina and I were at the Baltimore Comic Con, 2013, I think. And we just walked right up to the Valiant table. We gave them a copy of Time's Arrow. And we said, hey, we're a Sound of Thunder. We want to do some music with you guys. Valiant, being the cool company that they are, actually uh, were into it. We were in touch with their executives like the next week. We just went from there. So we had a great time working on that album. I'm a long time Shadow Man fan. That's one of my favorites. I was reading it back in 92 also. I've mentioned it before in the show. I still have my Shadow Man t-shirt from like 93 or 94. <laughs> and uh, I've got a piece of uh, Bob Hall art, as a matter of fact, from Shadow Man. So the It Was Metal comic is phenomenal. It's based on the lyrics of the songs on your album. It was metal, and I love how each story in the book, it's kind of a, well, it's an anthology, graphic novels, all themed around the album, and each page that opens before the story has the lyrics, who wrote the song, and then who did the comic. So that was brilliant, and you both, you and Nina worked hard on this book. You both wrote some of the stories in there. 
You edited the comic, Josh, and Nina did the layout of the book, which is outstanding. Comics readers may be familiar with some of these talents that have worked on the book. Bob Hall, I just mentioned. Rachel Persephone, I've spoken to before, interviewed her on the show, and I know she's a huge Saturday Man fan, as a matter of fact. Ben Templesmith, Rafer Roberts, Roberto De La Torre, and Barry Kitson, just to name some. There are so many diverse and talented writers and artists throughout this book. It's solid. How did you get this incredible team together to work on It Was Metal? Well, we were really lucky. The most important piece of it was having the experience with Valiant. We worked really closely with them on the Tales from the Dead Side album. We did that kind of the opposite of how we did It Was Metal. With Tales from the Dead Side, Valiant wrote the story, and half of the issues were even published already before we got the album out. And so we were working with the editor, Alejandro Arbona. We were on the phone with him. He was giving us plots before they were published so we could write songs based on those plots. And then they got us in touch with some of their artists for various pieces and parts of that project. So we first met Roberto De La Torre, who was one of the series artists on Shadow Man. He did an exclusive piece of art for us for a picture disc, a single from that album. We got in touch with Bob Hall through Valiant to do the interior of the vinyl edition. He did a homage to the Shadow Man number 19 cover with Aerosmith from the 90s. He drew us in the new version of Shadow Man on that. And uh, Barry Kitson did the outside, the main cover to the uh, vinyl. Once we had a couple of those guys, it became easier to get a hold of other people because they knew we were serious and we had the this licensing deal with Valiant. Even comics artists, they're a lot like metal musicians. Like as fans, we hold them in great esteem and you know we think of them as a really big deal. But in reality, a lot of them will take side work. So they're not that hard to get a hold of. <laughs> we got Rafer Roberts. He wrote three of the stories for us in the book. I think it just started as side work for him, but that became a really good relationship with him. He did a couple more stories for us after that as we got along really well. He and his wife, Andrea, who works for Diamond Comics Distributors, she they got us in touch with Ben Templesmith. You know, so it just kind of spider webbed out like that. The last couple of gaps we filled, the very last one actually came from uh, sending a letter to the Joe Kubert School of Art. I uh, told him we were looking for somebody to do a story and um, they put the word out for us. And that was how we got the last artist we hired on the book was uh, Robert Daniel Ryan, who did the Atlacott story. He was a Kubert School graduate. There are great stories in there. I mean, it's like I said, it's solid. Uh, some of my favorites, you know, Bob uh, Hall started off the first story, Phantom Flight. Aforementioned Ben Templesmith worked on Lifebringer. Roberto worked on Obsidian and Gold. Charles II, that was a really cool story. And that's something I understand that Nina wanted to write. That was based on historical rumor, I guess. That story was based very closely on the lyrics. So Rafer kind of basically storyboarded it. But I would say Nina basically wrote the story. And Rafer came up with the visuals. She wrote it as a sea shanty. So if you go back and read the lyrics, you put on your best pirate voice. Kind of read it like... She wrote it as a sea shanty. I guess the rumor was at some point that King Charles II was, they believed that the bones of Irishmen had some kind of special healing or restorative powers. So he would dig up the graves of Irishmen and grind their bones up and put it into a tincture and drink it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rafer played it that way too. Rafer has a gift for the last page surprise ending. So you'll notice uh, all of his stories have good like final panels or final pages. He came up with the ending, which I thought was a clever ending. And then it finishes up the book with Fortress of the Future Race. And that was uh, Barry Kitson did the art on that. The album is phenomenal. It's one of those albums that when you hear the last song, you're pumped up and ready to start all over again. 
You know, it leaves you <laughs> wanting to... St- really, you want to start all over. And it has a strong opening with Phantom Flight. A hidden Lifebringer, which is a good second song to go into, so you're not slowing down at all. I mean, things just keep hammering away. The title track, it was Metal, Charles II, and then a strong finish with Fortress of the Future Race. Has the comic brought new listeners to your music? Good question. Um, we're not really sure. Um, you know, this comic, we really wanted to do it from an artistic standpoint. It was very fulfilling for me, although it was a huge challenge. But it's hard to say because as much as I think we did a good job making it, we didn't really know how to promote a comic. And it's not distributed through diamonds. So I think you know we still have a, a good ways to go on getting the word out on it. But yeah, uh, mostly I think the people that we brought in through the comic are people like yourself that we've met at the Comic Cons we've done. So the book and the CD, or both together, are available on your website. Yep, that's right. A sound of thunderband.com. Right now, is that the only place to get it? No, you can get them both on Amazon, although we prefer you get it from us because we get more money that way. <laughs> right. I'm making the Mr. Burns finger tent over here. <laughs> also, if you buy it from us, you can get it autographed for free. We never charge for autographs. Um, and uh, you can get digital copies of the album on all the usual places, iTunes, Amazon, it's on Spotify. Um, working on getting an, a digital copy on Amazon, but there is a digital copy of the comic on our website. Excellent. Very good. Or I should say, excellent. excellent. Now, coming up for 2019, this will be your 10th anniversary as a group. What are your plans for next year? Well, funny you should bring that up. We just uh, we just finished having the discussion about our next uh, recording session. We just committed to starting some new tracks next month. We do have a 10th anniversary project in the works. There'll be a, a different kind of thing for us. I don't want to spill the beans yet, but we'll have a, um, a release. Let's just say we'll have a release to mark the 10th anniversary. We've got some more comic stuff in the works. That will be... Whereas we did an anthology this time, now we're going to work on one big story. And um, it will be very, very expansive. And we're uh, working on some new music for that. The music will be also expansive, more than a single album's worth. We've got some more covers in the works and some more original music over the horizon beyond the comics-related stuff. I've got like the next three or four years planned out in my mind. <laughs> good the next like six releases i think we have planned out it was metal was a bit of a change because you had done some mid-tempo music for the shadow man album and you wanted something a little less dark you know you wanted something a little more energetic so you did this with it was metal do you plan on continuing along that path in terms of the type of music we'll have to see what comes out i i want to say the next releases will be different from it was metal it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be slower We've always tried not to repeat ourselves, not back to back. I do think um, It Was Metal is in the same vein as Time's Arrow. 
album wise times arrows our last kind of real upbeat bright album that we did and then we did lesser key of solomon which was a little darker and proggy even a little classic rocky and then we did tales from the dead side which is dark and heavy a little more mid-tempo i never want to repeat ourselves i don't want an album to feel like product like oh they had to put out an album that sounded just like the last one because that's what the fans want and we prefer to drag our fans kicking and screaming along with us (laughs) One thing I would add to that, what Josh says is is very true. You know, in terms of what we do in in a typical rehearsal, we, you know, someone, you know, usually usually it's Josh has a guitar idea and we'll just throw it out there and start playing it. And we start playing along. And at the, you know, initially we really don't know where it's going. And then it starts taking shape individually and collectively have a conscious idea as to what direction we want it to go. So, yes, at this point, it's a mixture what's happening and what's spewing from us right now. It's certainly a mixture of higher tempo, more energetic and not so, you know, so it depends. Yeah, it's usually everything starts with just natural, good old musical vomit. Whatever comes out, comes out. At a certain point, you have to make a decision on where you want things to go. So with Tales from the Dead Side, well, we knew that that had to sound dark and it had to sound like New Orleans and it had to sound like voodoo. You know, so that's why that album came out a little slower, a little darker, a little heavier. If it was metal, we knew we wanted to go the opposite direction. I used the same line in all the press. I said I wanted to make an album that you could play in your car during the day, going down the highway at 100 miles an hour and just rock out. So when we were working on It Was Metal, we made the decision to push things towards faster tempos. And we usually have more ideas than we will finish at a time for one album. So we kind of selected the faster ones out of all the ideas we had. And so the next one, without giving anything away, there is some darkness again. Trouble. Yeah, there's definitely (laughs) some epic storytelling involved and some grandeur, but there's also some action. I don't know. I I think it'll probably be a blend of everything we've done before, some new stuff. We're actually experimenting with some black metal tonalities. We're not going to make a black metal album by any stretch. You know, Nina's voice is is what it is. We don't. Last thing we want to do is have her go try and do a black metal. impersonation you know but some of the chord structures from black metal are interesting and they're different for us and they kind of providing a little different flavor here and there it's just going to be a mix of that kind of everything we've done plus a little bit of progression and maybe a little more complicated not sure yet we're going to see where it goes we'll definitely take it in a direction that feels good because ultimately you know we want to do songs that are fun to play and fun to record and fun for people to listen to as you're developing songs do you take them on the road do you occasionally perform them live before they're released on CD or digitally? We have done that in the past, yes. I think It Was Metal was the first album where we didn't play any of the songs live before the album came out. I don't know. I I can't even remember why we didn't do that, really. Man, every other album release show we've ever had, we've always played a song from the next album. We've been very far ahead traditionally. Now we're going to have some time. We're going to be working on a lot of new stuff coming up pretty soon. I think we'll probably start playing some of them out. It'll be fun for us. It's something we enjoy doing. It's kind of on-the-spot pressure. We rehearse a lot, too, since we all live in the same area. We rehearse twice a week as a band, and then Chris and I have an extra third rehearsal usually every week. When we have new stuff that we're getting ready to record, we play it a lot. It develops pretty well just in rehearsal, but then sometimes we will take it out live, too. Now, your next event is coming up, I believe, January 5th at Auto Bar in uh, Baltimore. You're going to be there with a bunch of other bands as well performing that, that evening on January 5th. Is that... All ages? Good question. Um, I'm not sure. I might be able to tell you real quick. Um, I'm just wondering because my seven-year-old's been like, I want to go to a concert with you. I'm like, well, I don't know if you're old enough yet. He goes, well, how old do I have to be? I said, well, I don't know if there's a rule. It depends on the venue. It depends on what the rules are. I don't know. <laughs> but he's uh, really interested in going along with that. Oh, sweet. Does he kind of take an interest in, in music in general? Or? Oh, yes. He listens to all kinds of music, hip-hop metal. He listens to what I listen to because he's in the car with me, so he's got to listen to it. He's exposed to it. Just like my dad, you know, just like my dad played country music, I'm playing the metal music. So I'll catch him every once in a while playing some metal music. So, um, yeah. I have good news because according to this Facebook event, it is an all-ages show. Road trip. (laughs) Yeah. Bring your plugs. We're not too far, so uh, I was really excited to see you'll be in the area. Of course, you're in the area, but you're going to be performing in the area. We're in kind of a weird spot where we used to play every two months. We used to play a lot. 
And now we're in this kind of gray area between being the local band and being the national band. And we can't play around here as often. We need to make a little bigger, bigger splash when we play. So we're playing two or three times a year locally now. Our last one was in Baltimore. the Baltimore Comic Con, which you yeah. came to. So that'll be it. Yeah, every four months, I guess. You've played at the Ram's Head too, right? It was metal album release show. It was Ram's Head in August. I'm definitely going to come to the next event. I know I'm coming, and I'm going to let my son know, and I'm sure he'll want to go, too. Fantastic. Cool. Now, it's time for my fun questions I ask all my guests, just to learn more about you as creators, as people. Josh, I'll start with you, and then Chris, you can give me your answer. What do you like to do for rest and relaxation? <laughs> rest and relaxation. Is there such a thing? <laughs> well, relaxation, I like to work out. I run. I was a cross-country runner in high school, and I still do a little running. I like to go to the gym. Rest. I kind of have a hard time turning off. I work on the band a lot, but um, I read comics. Right now I'm reading uh, Marvel Masterworks Incredible Hulk Volume 10, which is Hulk uh, in the 170s and 180s. So I've got the first appearance of Wolverine coming up pretty soon. Excellent. How about you, Chris? Well, actually, when I can get to the gym, I like to work out. I'm a big cardio nut, but uh, I enjoy, as far as, you know, like Josh mentioned earlier, I basically am able to play my drums three days a week, which... I'm very, very, very fortunate uh, because there are many, many bands who don't bands and who do not have that ability or that convenience, and, and I do. So that's a workout. My general approach to playing drums is, is quite physical, so that's something I enjoy putting forth that energy. And and besides that, um, I'm a big reader too. I just don't like, like I said earlier. I don't read comics. I have my nose typically in about two or three books at a time, all the time. And um, enjoy music. Love listening to music. I mean, I'm just I'm a big music nut. I hardly ever watch TV. I just go on YouTube and, and look at videos of, of bands that I like or would like to investigate. Thinking back to any birthday, which one stands out in your mind and why? Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I can answer that flat out. It was my 29th birthday. The guy I was dating at the time happened to look across the dinner table and see a gray hair. And he said, you have a gray hair. I said, no! <laughs> and thankfully, I did not go prematurely gray. Thankfully, I went gray very slowly. But uh, yeah, I mean, he said, yeah, right there. He pointed across the table. 29th birthday. That was it, right there. That was late. My grays came in much sooner. <laughs> uh, for me, I can't remember the year, but it was probably around 31, 32. We had a gig. It was on my birthday. It was the night that we met one of our biggest fans for the first time, a guy named Tim Searbaugh. He's started putting on a private show at his home every year, always centers it on us. We headline it, and he brings in a huge audio setup and tons of people, and he's been a huge backer of the band. And that was the first night we met Tim, so that was a special show for that reason. And it was my birthday, and Nina brought in a, some kind of cake that I found delicious, but everyone else found horrid, because I like the really cheap sheet cakes with a ton of that cheap frost. Was that the time you ate the entire sheet cake? Probably. Oh, no. And um, <laughs> she, bought me a, she bought me a zip-up Captain America hoodie. Oh, I remember that. That goes, that goes down over your eyes and has, like, eye slits. Oh, cool. <laughs> I remember just having a really good time and we've got a picture of all of us with me wearing that stupid hoodie that was great <laughs> yeah because i came back for a piece of cake the, 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 the next day or something and it was gone oh, i demolished it gone the old cheat cake <laughs> oh my god <laughs> now thinking back to a very specific period in your life middle school age what pictures or posters did you have on the bedroom wall josh oh man zeppelin zeppelin that was Chris. Okay. You know what? In middle school, it would have been pull-out posters from comics, pinups from the annuals, and um, pull-out posters from like Spawn and Savage Dragon, and probably the X Men uh, Executioner's Song crossover had posters. And I can't remember what like my first rock and metal posters were. Oh, they would have been from magazines too. Ozzy stuff. I was a huge Ozzy fanatic. So back in the days of like hard rock magazines, I remember I had a. Uh, they did a special issue all on Ozzy. And man, I think I pulled every page out of that thing and stapled it to my door. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a hypothetical question for you both. You're stuck on a deserted island. To pass the time, what is the one book you would want to have with you if you're stuck on that island? Chris, you're an avid reader. What would be that one book? Oh my God, I have to choose one. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, wow. Where do I go with this? I can think of different parts points in my life and different 
authors and different. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can I have a choice of 10? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not dodging the question, honestly. No, I know it's tough because I could ask you that question every year and it would probably be something different. It would be, it would change. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go right to this book. It's a book I read about two years ago, and I happened to see Jesse was reading the exact same book and had it with him on tour while we were in Spain. I looked at it and I said, ah, I read that about two years ago. And it's a phenomenal book. It's called The Road by Carmack McCarthy. Okay, and what's that about? It's not a happy book. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's an apocalyptic future. Kind right? of apocalyptic kind of future and how these people are dealing with it and how a son and his, a father and his son are dealing with it. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very intense read. There you go. I would do that. <laughs> Ask me 10 minutes from now, I'd, I'd give it up. <laughs> All right. Josh, how about you? Do you have that one book you'd want to have with you? Well, I was tempted to say something by Ray Bradbury, but since I'm stuck on the island for who knows how long, his books are all pretty short. So unless I can get a 1,200-page compilation of all his short stories, I guess I would have to go with um, Lord of the Rings. That'll keep you busy for a while. Am I allowed to take all three uh, all three parts in one book? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I do allow like sets. If it's volume one or a collection of something, someone says, I want Harry Potter, all the books, then that's fine. It's the collection. I enjoy Lord of the Rings. That would take me away and pass the time for me. So yeah, we go Lord of the Rings. One more hypothetical. A toy company says, I'm going to make an action figure of you. Now, what do you want to be your accessory with that action figure? <laughs> you can go with the first one that comes to no, mind, whatever, Chris's, you know? Chris's mind obviously went straight to the gutter. <laughs> it went <laughs> directly to the gutter. No, no, um, oh, God. Oh, Lord. I think drumsticks would be involved. Uh, that's that's a, such a strong part of my life. I disagree. I think Chris's should be a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go against uh, expectations because it should probably be the guitar, but I'm going to say uh, my border collie, Maddie. People have said pets before, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, you've already, I think, answered the next question for Chris, your beverage of choice. Is that Jack Daniels, Chris? <laughs> He's <laughs> making me sound like some sort there's of there's literally alcohol. there's literally a bottle of Jack Daniels sitting in front of him right now I've, that he carried up here for this interview. <laughs> I take very small steps and I take occasional steps. No, actually, I'm going to spend a second to just explain that before it's no secret. Before we take the stage, we do a band shot. My shot of choice is indeed Jack Daniels, and it's the only liquor I drink. That if I drink a liquor, it is Jack Daniels only. Of the alcoholic variety, yeah, I go with Jack Daniels. Okay, no messing around. All right. <laughs> How about you, Josh? If I'm looking to make bad decisions, Johnny Walker Black Label. <laughs> okay. yeah. Most of the most of the dumb things I've done while drunk have happened after Johnny Walker Black Label. Um, <laughs> Or if I just want a beer, I'm going uh, Newcastle Brown. Yes, I've had that. Very good. Now my final question. What is the one question that you've not been asked in an interview? Something that you want people to ask you about, something you want them to know about you, but it just has not come up. What would that one question be? And you know, you have to answer it. Josh, what would that be? Only one. Um, hmm. That's a tough one. Either favorite band and why. Perhaps an alternate to that. Favorite band that nobody would expect you to pick and why see i would think people would ask you that a lot like what's your favorite what do you listen to but they, they tend to ask like what what do you listen to okay but it's never like what's your favorite band and why that's never been phrased exactly that way i have things i can say about that and that would probably end up being black sabbath if it was the what's your favorite band that people wouldn't expect and i would say hawkwind I could go on a whole diatribe about why Hawkwind rules. Now, I'm not familiar with them. If you meet people that know about Hawkwind, 90% of them will know Hawkwind because it was the band that Lemmy was in before Motorhead. Okay. And that was how I found them. But they're a super interesting band because they have a bunch of different periods with vastly different musical styles, and they never stay in one style for more than three or four albums. So they've got a bunch of different periods of like acid rock, and then kind of punk new wave and then metal and then electronica, but all kind of kind of spacey with driving rhythm and guitars under it and good songs. Worth checking out some Hawkwind. And if you're a Motorhead fan, then go for the Hawkwind albums with Lemmy. Good recommendation. Chris, what's that one question? <laughs> Again, I can list about 50. One of the things that popped in my mind after thinking about it for a second you know, Nina and I both write the lyrics for the music, and she writes a lot. There are certain songs that I've 
written the lyrics, no one's ever really, ever really asked, well, why specifically did you write this song be that way, the lyrics for that song? That would be one thing that would occur to me. One thing that surprised me over the years is we get relatively few inquiries about specific lyrics. Yeah. We put a lot of time and thought into the lyrics. Although I had one fan message me one night, just the night after work. I got home after work. It was kind of 8-ish, 8.30, whatever. And I was, you know, cracked a beer, making dinner. And uh, I might have even been single at the time. I don't think I was living with my ex-boyfriend at the time. But anyway, she messaged me. And she thanked me for a certain uh, song that, for which I had written lyrics because she said it got her through a really tough time. And I, that, that kind of meant a lot to me, really did mean a lot to me. And I messaged her back in kind. And my response was, well, I'm glad it did help. It kind of helped me <laughs> three, three, four years before, you know. Which song was that? This Too Shall Pass on Out of the Darkness. It's a song that you will never hear live, most likely. <laughs> mm, okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, you'll, you'll understand why we need to Half of it is vocals and string quartet only. If people are not asking a lot of questions about the lyrics, I'd urge them, check out the album, It Was Metal, by A Sound of Thunder, and also check out the graphic novel, the anthology, because the lyrics are in there. Give it some thought, look it over, and listen to the album while you're reading it. It's a great experience. Josh and Chris, thank you so much for being on Creator Talks. Thank you. Thank you so much for interviewing us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having us on, Chris. Joining me next week on Creator Talks, the Wicked and the Divine writer Karen Gillen, along with artist Stephanie Hans of The Wicked and the Divine, 1831, and Journey into Mystery, to talk about their latest book, Die. Karen joins me from the UK, and Stephanie joins me from France. This is Stephanie's first ongoing comic about a group of 40-something adults who have to deal with the returning unearthly horror they barely survived as teenage role players. Now, you don't have to know anything about role-playing games to enjoy this story. It's a great story, and it is rooted in their love of role-playing games. So, if you like role-playing games, you'll enjoy this even more. I just want to take a moment to say a few words about the passing of Stan Lee. Uh, The news broke about that this week. I heard about it from one of my guests, and I never met Stan Lee. I wish I had, but by the time I was going to cons, because of Stan's advanced age and frailty, Getting close to him, spending time with him, having any kind of contact or conversation was extremely limited by his handlers. And that's what I really wanted to do was have a chance to chat with him. However, I was exposed to a lot of his work as a youth. And I would not love comics like I do today were it not for Stan Lee. The very first comic I ever remember having read to me was a March 1970 issue of Marvel Tales, number 25. It was given to me by my aunt... Her son had a copy of it, scribbled in it, tore off the cover, and replaced it with a copy of Fantastic Four number 97, The Creature from the Lost Lagoon. That comic was beat. And it wasn't that old, and it was probably read to me in late 1970 or early 1971. But why it had such a lasting impression on me was that it contained three Stan Lee's stories. Man on a Rampage, which was written by Stan Lee and drawn by Steve Ditko, it was from the issue of Spider-Man, where Spider-Man is trapped under heavy machinery and he's trying to bring medicine to his dying aunt. And he's defeated by Dr. Octopus. Another very important story in that book was The Birth of the Beetle, written by Stan Lee and drawn by Carl Burgos, the original artist for The Human Torch, his only Silver Age work for Marvel. And then finally, the most important and my favorite story of all, The Mighty Thor Battles the Incredible Hulk, drawn by Jack Kirby, a reprint from Journey into Mystery, where it's determined who is stronger, the Mighty Thor or the Incredible Hulk. So I don't know exactly what it was about the characters that Stan co-created. I don't know if it was the colorful costumes, 
how it was easier to relate to the characters, the way they had more emotion in the dialogue between the characters. And maybe it was the way Stan just wrote to the readers in the letter pages and the way he addressed us through the Stanley soapbox. And he was always an enthusiastic, great promoter of the Marvel Universe. So today I like all kinds of comics. Marvel, DC, comics published through Image, Boom, Dark Horse, Dynamite, you name it. But what got me started was that one comic, that first comic, where the stories were written by Stan Lee. And that changed my life. It's not easy growing up as an adolescent and as a teenager. But one refuge I had, one place I could always turn to to escape from the pressures of the world, were those characters that Stan co-created and the comic books that he published through Marvel Comics. Thank you, Stan Lee, for all you did to bring joy and excitement to readers of all ages through your comics. For Creator Talks, this has been your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time.